Aloha Pumiana Kako o Kawaii ko Umoku o Anahola ko Ahapua o Kalalea ko U Mauna o Kioni Keloa Mahelona ko Uinoa. Aloha everyone. Uh, I'm from Hawaii, uh, the island of Kauai, and my name's Kioni. Thanks for um, letting me uh, present to you today in this um, different way. I think I prefer being live on stage. Um, I'm a bit nervous <laughs> in front of the camera. Um, but oh well, here we are. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be mixing uh, this live. This is all recorded live. Um, and um, yeah, there might be some technical difficulties, but I'm sure we're all used to that. This is a JavaScript conference. Um, uh, I'm from Teiku Media. We're a small organization, non-for-profit. Um, there's some links there and some Twitter handles uh, for those of you who like to do the Twitter thing. Now I have to start with um, our um, our mission and you know our vision in terms of why we exist and, and how we operate. Now I'm just gonna um, do some magic here. There we are. Um, there I am. Hi, I I'm still here. So the point of our organization, or the reason why we exist, is to help with the revitalization and preservation and promotion of Te Reo Māori. And Te Reo Māori is the indigenous language of New Zealand. That's the first language of this country um, before you know the, the British, etc., came over um, in the 18th century uh, and, and 19th century. For us, we are based in the very far north of the North Island of New Zealand. And if you look at the uh, New Zealand on a map, the North Island kind of looks like a stingray. And so that's the ika, or the fish. And we're at the tail of that stingray, or the hiku, the tail. So te hiku or te ika um, is sort of the place name uh, for where we are. And that's why we are te reo irirangi, uh, the radio of te hiku or te ika, the tail of the fish. So when we talk about language of idolization preservation, for us, we represent five different tribes from this region. Uh, that's Ngai Tokoto, Te Ao Pauri, Ngati Kahu, Ngati Kuri, and Te Rarua. And so our mission is to capture the stories and the culture um, of the people from this region, of those five tribes. Now we started in radio uh, in 1991. Um, we exist because uh, of a treaty claim so there's, in this country, we have a Treaty of Waitangi, which sort of sets up a legal framework um, between the indigenous tribes of this country and the crown today, and, and, and the crown previously when it was under sort of a British, British crown or whatever. Um, and that actually is it's good because it means we have a legal, legal framework um, to rectify sort of historical injustices against the indigenous people of this country. And, and that has allowed us to have a radio station. Um, and it allows us, Māori, to even have a, a TV station, uh, a national uh, television station. And so the, po the whole point here is to, to be able to broadcast in our language, because Māori didn't have a place on the airwaves. It was all predominantly New Zealand English. Um, and, and so the whole point was to get Māori a space on, in the airwaves so that our language could be heard um, throughout the country um, by our people and, and by the people of New Zealand. Of course, it's 2019, um, and media today, uh, uh, media broadcast industry is very different from what it used to be um, back in the 90s. Um, and you know, one of the strategies for us is to have that digital presence. So, so what you see here is our what we call our Fare Uh That is our our media platform, our digital platform. Um, you know, for the end user, uh, it's a website. Um, but for us, it's actually, it's, this, it's a Django-based um, website. So it actually serves as um, a place to, to, to manage our content, to distribute our content, and, and as a repository as well. So when we put things in our digital platform, we often put them in sort of archival quality. So like that means the best quality of audio or video. And the platform uh, encodes that into the formats that are necessary to distribute online, um, you know, for little devices like these, and for people with slow internet connections. So, it's really this the one digital place that all of our content goes to, and then it does what it needs to do and automatically distributes um, things out. Now, when we 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 launched this in 2014, <coughs> and it took us a while to get there because. 
we used to operate on a WordPress site. And the problem with, with that is that, um, well, it, WordPress was, you know, for, for um, what is it, blogging. <laughs> um, and that sort of, it, it was quite static. And, and, you know, for us, we needed something that was content driven. Um, of course, the other challenge is where do you host or store your videos and your audio recordings? And so what, what we used to do and what other, um, other EV radio stations like us used to do and still do is they put their content in places like YouTube uh, or Facebook or SoundCloud. This is great because it's free. Um, the downside to that is you sort of cede some sovereignty over your data by putting it in those platforms. So you, you give up some level of Western ownership uh, to a foreign corporate so they can use your data to make a profit uh, or whatever. And that did not align with our cultural values. And that was really the key reason why we decided, hey, we have to build our own platform. We can't just um, use WordPress and, and, and YouTube. Um, and since then, um, that's really helped us to grow in terms of reaching more audiences online. So here you have um, this Taitokura Festival collection. Uh, what this is, is a festival that happens every year in our region. Um, and it's a Kapahaka festival. So Kapahaka is a traditional Maori dance. Um, and this competition, usually there are about 30 different schools. These are uh, secondary um, schools and some uh, intermediate schools. And they just come up and they just perform. And what our job is to do is to live stream those performances so that people who can't make it or so that their friends and family can see them performing. So it actually gives you know, our people in our region um, a platform and a place to sort of be seen uh, online and digitally. The other thing we do is we cut up these performances and, and make them available on demand. Uh, so we have this, uh, the, you know, this workflow where we, you know, we have to, um, we're live, live streaming and then live recording and we have to do as quickly as possible, cut each performance up and make it available. And, and actually this platform that we've developed has been designed around being able to do that really quickly because the sooner you can get the on demand up, um, you know, the better, right? Everyone wants to binge watch um, all of their Netflix, uh, you know, Stranger Things all at once, right? You don't want to have to wait um, an hour or, or every other week, uh, what have you. So that's been really important is having control of that platform and being able to, to make it work to our workflows as, as a media organization. So our first live stream was actually in 2014. This was before Facebook was doing live stream, before Twitter bought Periscope. Um, and it just seemed like the natural thing for us because uh, live broadcasts have always been a thing, um, you know, for, for community radio. You sort of go out into the community and you set up um, some equipment and you do a radio broadcast from, you know, from outside of a, a new opening of a new building or from a festival in your community. So we've been doing sort of live broadcasts like in out, outdoor broadcasts as we call them for years. Um, adding video was just, you know, the, the obvious next thing to do. And because we were so good at outdoor broadcasts, uh, all we had to do was just add a camera to the mix and, and then we could do live video streaming. So this live stream here was uh, the Hokulea, which is a traditional Hawaiian um, voyaging canoe. And this is the second time that it sailed to New Zealand. This was during its worldwide voyage. So some quick little history on the Hokulea. And um, there was this thing called Kontiki where a Westerner basically said the Polynesians um, did not know how to navigate and they found the islands in the Pacific by chance by floating on a raft. Um, and of course, he, 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 um, he was saying uh, that, um, uh, well, what he did was he, he built this raft and, 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 and launched from uh, the west coast of South America and, and was, was sort of proving that, you know, the currents would then take him um, to somewhere in the Pacific. Um, anyways. What we did was we said, no, you're absolutely wrong. We revitalized our um, traditional knowledge around sea navigation, and we sailed this canoe without GPS, without any of that stuff, all the way from Hawaii um, down to uh, the middle of the Pacific. So that was sort of a cultural renaissance for us. So it was really important for us to be able to, to live stream um, this. And since then, we've had some other interesting um, uh, gigs that we've had to do. So I put this one up here because um, we had to live stream uh, um, a waka'ama, which is a canoe paddling race, canoe paddling. And um, it was out in the water. 
and we're we're small non for, for profit, so we don't have really flash um, wireless video transmission stuff because those can cost like up to ten grand just for for one sort of unit. Um, so we decided to use Raspberry Pis and iPhones um, uh, to stream from. <laughs> out in the water back to us. And the iPhone's great because it's got a camera, it's got a battery, and it's got an internet connection, right? So, um, and we had, you know, we, they're relatively affordable compared to your, your fancy broadcast cameras. Um, and the Raspberry Pis, we're using open source software to ingest uh, these live streams and play them out to a vision mixer. So it was, it was our little party trick, um, and it allowed us to do uh, live mixing of a, um, uh, uh, a canoe race on on a low low budget so i've just got a video here uh, of showing this so we did a live cross um uh to someone out on one of these boats and it was just like it was this moment of everything just had to work because you know it's all sort of hacked together and it's raspberry pies so they have to restart every now and then so it was it was like amazing we did this live cross and when it was done we were all cheering um but anyways i'll just i just want to show you this <laughs> He's just referencing the previous speakers. Gary, our driver, he's taking us on this boat so that we can see the waka up close. Well, if you want a job, hey, uh, <laughs> come and live in New Zealand. Um, yeah, so that was, that's a live cross um, to a boat using iPhones and Raspberry Pis. <clears throat> and since then, we've been uh, doing a lot of live streams. It's, it's you know, it's a lot of work. Um, some of these events are two days long, which means you're, you're out there for three to four days to set up and, and, and break down. Um, they're really long days, but it's so important to the community because it gives, it, it gives our community a place, you know, digitally in terms of, you know, having, ha giving families the opportunity to attend some of these events digitally because they can't, you know, they physically can't be there, or, or, you know, they might live in Australia because they're working, that's where the work is, and this allows them to sort of reconnect with their community. And it, you know, it also allows us as an organization to go back into the community, you know, to, to be a part of that community. Um, these events are put on by volunteers a lot of the times, and you've got teachers and students and parents all working together, you know, to bring speech competitions um, and, and kapahaka um, performances. So it really is a community effort. And you know, that helps, it helps us as an organization to build trust with the community. And it also reminds us of, of who we're accountable for. Like, because we're a nonprofit, uh, we don't have shareholders in, like our shareholders aren't investors um, who are looking for a financial return. Our, our shareholders or the people who hold us accountable is actually, you know, it's these, some of these people you see on the screen here, um, it, it is our community. And so if we do the wrong thing, our community are the one to let us know that we've done the wrong thing. And, and, and that's been really important. This is just a snapshot of our team where uh, we're about half of that. So like whenever we go into these gigs, we always have to um, you know, rely on volunteers or students or freelancers um, you know, to help us with our work. So we've been around since 1991 and we were recording native speakers um, way back when, you know, sitting down with them, just having a casual conversation, talking about traditional Maori medicine, um, talking about the environment, about all sorts of things, uh, Maori science. And even today, and since 2014, since the launch of our digital platform, like every day we have people on the radio here um, speaking the language, interviewing people from the community. And the moment that's done, we take those interviews um, and we upload them into the digital platform and, and then they get distributed. So we have this huge archive of indigenous, not just the indigenous language, but also the data. That's, I mean, like the knowledge that the things that are being said, so the content of the things are putting there um, is, 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 is very valuable. And so now the challenge for us is how do we make that data more accessible um, to our people? 
how do we make the content in those recordings from the 90s um, and, and even the ones that we make online today, how do we make that more accessible? Um, so we had, an we, ha we had an idea, and, and we built this collection here, Tereo Te Kaing. I'll, I'll just quickly show it to you. Um, <clears throat> so what you see here is a moving transcript, in, uh, along with a native speaker interview. That's Auntie Lenny. She's one of our board members. In a mahinga, e in a hau hakingi ai. So in red are colloquialisms or words that are unique to the language in our region. And so when you're a native speaker, uh, sorry, when you're a fluent speaker, um, oftentimes in what you want to do in terms of, um, you know, like you're fluent, but you want to be better, you want to, we call it sort of a right shift um, to improve in your language. One thing you often do is go back to um, the language of your people or your particular tribe and try to learn some of those old colloquialisms that a lot of native speak speakers have used but maybe aren't in use anymore because of colonization, because of sort of mainstream Maori being taught in schools and, and at universities. So this collection was an opportunity to sort of bring that, that language that our native speakers use and make it more accessible to language learners. And as you watch this, you can see um, where those words and idioms are used uh, throughout throughout the whole database. So, so what you see here is is um, this auntie um, using the word "takao" in in these different places in in her video. Okay. You can also share these in context. So, if you want to share the use of this word "keho," um, when you click that Twitter link, it actually generates a link that takes you to exactly that. Um, that time in the video, um, which means, you know, if an interview is two hours long and you don't have two hours, you can very quickly f um, find, you know, those, those, those gems that might exist in these archives and then access them. So anyways, that was an idea that we had for making archives more accessible. Of course, the hard part here wasn't all the, like, UI JavaScript stuff. I mean, that was hard, but... But the real challenge here was actually doing the transcriptions. It took a long time, um, you know, to transcribe these, and there aren't very many people who can because these are they're native speakers, um, they're very old, and um, you know the language that they use is very unique to this region. So there are only a handful of people who are actually able to to transcribe um, these sorts of these sorts of interviews. So, what do you do? Um, Let's get back here, sorry. Well, you teach machines to do the work for you. <laughs> um, yeah, so so we thought obviously the next thing to do was to, you know, just train machines to do transcriptions for us. Um, because the technology's there, right? Like Siri was around at, at the time of this project. Um, you know, speech recognition um, ha has actually been around for a long time and has since improved uh, drastically. Um, yeah, so we decided that we would try and um, teach computers Tereo Māori. Um, just looking at my time here. Look, the most important part about this project wasn't actually like the technology or, um, you know, the speech recognition. The most important part about this Kōrero Māori project was how and why we went about doing Tereo Māori speech recognition. Because in terms of you know language processing, it's really about the data, and the data is super important. Like you need the data to do the work, um, and you know as we've seen with like the Cambridge Analytica scandal and and and, and you know um, Amazon and Apple just sort of listening to random conversations that people are having. Like like privacy and and all that stuff is so important to society, and and for us as an indigenous people, like. The colonizers have have taken a lot. You know, they've taken they've taken all of our land, pretty much, um, and we're not going to let them have our data. So, in terms of this project, um, we knew from the beginning that the the data was going to be like the most important part of this project. Not the technology. The technology was there, but how we how we looked after the data was going to be really important. So, what you see here is um, just some of the key. So the key things for us in terms of, of this project and, and why we're doing it. So the why is that, you know, we want we want Tereo Māori 
to have a place in the digital realm. And in order to do that, um, <laughs> you're going to need you're going to need Maori speech recognition and speech synthesis. So it's very much a part of the revitalization effort and the promotion and the and 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 the proliferation of Te Reo Maori. Um, but also remembering that you know, like this work that we do here actually comes from uh, a, a settlement with the treaty that helps to fund this work. And that just reminds us of the past injustices done by the government to the indigenous people of Aotearoa in terms of laws that disenfranchise Maoris, law that prohibited, prohibited, prohibited our, you know, our tupuna from speaking their languages. They weren't allowed to speak their languages in schools. They were, they were slapped for doing that. And so remembering that is really important. Also, that we have sovereignty or autonomy over, over the data and over these tools so that we can use them in a Maori way. And of course, we want to create tech opportunities for our people. And what better way to get Maori and indigenous people and minorities into tech than to work on, work on language tools um, you know, f for, for their languages? It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Um, so for us, in terms of the data, like, it's kind of like traditional views of land. Indigenous people don't own land. They've never owned land. They've only looked after the land. Because if you take care of the land, it'll take care of you. Clearly, that's not what capitalism and Western society is about. I mean, look at the destruction of our environments, of our rainforests, um, all in the name of wealth and short-term gains. Um, so for us, in terms of the data, we don't own it, we look after it, and that's what kaitiaki means. Kaitiaki is, is guardian or guardianship. And so kaitiaki tanga is this idea that we are the guardians of this data that we're collecting in order to do speech recognition, and we are only going to use it for our kaupapa. We're only going to use it to help with the revitalization and promotion of te reo Māori. Um, so then we had to get data, and um, long story short, we built our own platform to manage the, um, the data collection, the corpus gathering. It's very similar to Mozilla's Common Voice um, project, if you're familiar with that. <coughs> um, and what I'm showing you here is a video, right. OK. Uh, so the challenge is actually getting the data. And we weren't Amazon, so we couldn't build you know, s cheap little devices and get people to pay $79 for them and talk to them and get all this great data and then build sort of the best speech recognition system in the world. Um, but we were able to basically pay our people to speak their language, which is sort of different than how revitalization efforts usually work. It's usually like you pay all these government departments and money trickles down. And by the time it gets to the communities, there's not much left. So we sort of flipped that upside down and said, hey, let's get people to form groups and if they read the most sentences, they can win a lot of money. Hey, here, here are they on the coast of Tite Mahimundi, Motoro Pu, Kaura, and welcome to the Hopu Korero Māori competition. Get a head start on your fundraising this year, folks. First prize, $3,000. Second prize, $2,000. Third prize, $1,000. Your Opu can also be in to win one of three spot prizes of $500. Go to KoreroMaori.com and sign up now. you got to be in to win. Get seven of your friends. Every Roku must have at least seven members. Every Roku must read Maori language sentences. And the Roku with the most points at that. So ro Roku means group in Maori. Anyway, so that's our little um, campaign that we did um, to get people to, to speak uh, Te Reo Maori. And, um, well, the punchline is that it worked. <laughs> So we were able to get um, over 300 hours in 10 days, which is pretty phenomenal, actually. I mean, some academics work in this field of language re revitalization and maybe have 50, 50 hours after like eight years of work. I think Mozilla, in the first, the first sort of bit of 500 hours, took about maybe five months or so. So we were doing pretty good. Um, it was a lot of work running that campaign. Um, our community broke our servers a lot because we actually had to what we really built was this sort of online real-time game, but we didn't realize that's what we did. But anyways, that's what happened. Um, yeah, I, I've sort of talked about this, and, and that's not the right question to ask, like who owns the data. That's, that's the absolute wrong question to ask, because it's not about ownership. It's about guardianship and looking after it um, in a culturally important way. <clears throat> of course, now we've got all this data. 
Um, we know that what we want to do with it, train machines to, to speak, speak the language. But, um, you know, I've got, I've got a line there asking this sort of question. You know, if we give Microsoft access to the data, could they sell transcription services back to our people? So could other foreign corporates sell Tereo Māori language as a service? And when you look at, you know, your cloud providers like AWS, Google, um, you can actually, they do provide languages as a service. And, and it's, it's becoming increasingly important in terms of the new apps that we're building and, and assistance and all these things. Like, sp like speech is, you know, one of the next interfaces, right? And so people are going to need access to this. But by doing that, we're allowing non-Maori or not indigenous organizations to sell indigenous languages. And that does not align with us. That's like, that's colonization 3.0, right? Um, so that's really important. And we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Or if it does happen, we want to make sure that you know any sort of monetary gain that these corporates might get from that comes back to our people, or that the data they collect on our our people actually comes back to us, so we have um, guardianship over that, rather than it staying you know out of our reach um, in these foreign corporates. Um, and so that's you know that's been a big thing for us is 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 it's this catch twenty two like. Um, if we want the language to be ubiquitous, if we want Siri to speak Tereo Māori, like Apple's going to need some of our cultural data and knowledge in order to do that. And, and, you know, we're happy to do that if they're willing to do it under our terms. But if they don't want to do it under our terms, then, then, it, then it's not going to happen. Um, and, and I think, you know, as you've seen here with the different platforms that we've built, you know, that's why that autonomy and that sovereignty is so important, because it means yeah, actually, we can do this. Like, you know, we don't need this big corporate to come in and save the day for us. That's this white savior com complex, right? It's like our people are better off if duolingual can teach our indigenous language, right? It's like, mm, um, actually, that's not the best way to, to teach an indigenous language. So that sovereignty is, has been so important for us. Um, Hopefully by now you've, you've, you've wrote down that link. So we're, we're working on a new open source license that's sort of built from an indigenous perspective. It's a work in progress. There's a lot of work to do. But the, the gist of it is kind of like affirmative action for indigenous data and technology. So to give preference to indigenous peoples. Because um, we don't live in a utopia. Um, um, you know, there's this thing called privilege. And so some people, whilst something is open source on GitHub, there's a, a group of people, predominantly male and stale, um, white males, who are, who, who, are more, uh, who are more able to access the open source tools, right? Because the, the minorities and the indigenous people, you know, they're still catching up. They're, they're still worrying about how they're gonna feed their kids, not all my kid can write code, right? So because of that um, privilege gap, um, we think that we need to rethink how we open source our technology and our data so that our people actually have an advantage. That's the gist of our Kaitiaki Tonga license. Um, I'm looking at my clock here. Um, I'm, I'm more or less out of time. Um, I, I, I do have a quick demo. So, so look, when you can do um, speech recognition, te nā koe. And when you can do uh, speech synthesis, um, you know, and when you've got a, 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 you know, a platform like this that has an API, um, you can do this. E pai ana a hau. Anui te pai e pai. No hea koe. O kai hau. Hea hau ngā take o te tai toke rau. Ai ngā take o te tai toke rau. Ngā take o te tai toke rau. So I just asked her, what's the, um, she said she's, I asked her where was she from, she said she's from Kaitaia, so I said, well, what's the news up there? And, and, and so yeah, so she pulled the, the news from our, from our platform. We, we do the regional news for our area. Anyway, so there you go, there's your um, work in progress, 
indigenous language, um, completely te reo Māori speech assistant. Uh, yeah, so anyways, thank you very much for your time. Ka kite.